Welcome to the broadcast today. We're actually getting into the second part of a message entitled Mothers with a Message. Some of these gals in the scripture did amazing exploits and, and changed their generations uh, with the help of God. And I think we've got some women on the horizon that are going to be doing some significant things, will continue to do significant things in our day. So male or female, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, let's invest some time together and look at some of these gals in the Bible, some of these women in the Bible that changed their generation. And uh, let's get inspired by them. Let, let's learn from their example and what the scripture has to say about them. So if you got a Bible, why don't you grab it? Let's invest a little time together. Let's get into the Word of God. And I believe you are going to be blessed through today's broadcast. Now Samuel, her son, grew up to be the very last and the very greatest of all of Israel's judges. And that's interesting because you think as a young boy, I mean, he's just been weaned. Some, some people think he was about five. Some people think a little younger. She brought him there, gave him to Eli. And did you notice we, ran at the beginning of the, we read at the beginning of the story, it said Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, the sons of the priests were there. Well, you read on later about these boys, and they're wicked. They've been raised, quote, in church, but they're stealing the offerings. So then the Bible says the people detested even bringing an offering to the Lord because the boys were putting everything in their pockets. They were stealing, and everyone in Israel knew it. And not only that, they're sleeping with the girls in church. And the indication, though it's not absolutely clear, the indication is they're actually having sex with them in the church building. And so it, it was a terrible situation, and that's what Eli, or that's rather what Samuel as a young boy has been thrust into. And a question, how does a small child remain pure and serve God while surrounded by sin and compromise and ungodly peer pressure. Here's these two boys, and it's interesting names Eli gave his kids, you know, I, maybe it was prophetic, Hophni and Phinehas, you know, Pugilist and Serpent Mouth. That's what their Hebrew names mean. Somebody that likes to fight with his fist, and the other one got the tongue of a serpent, poisonous bite. And here's this young boy. Can you imagine the peer pressure from those two older boys to do wickedly? Hannah knew what was going on with those boys and in the church when she left her son there, but she kept her promise to God. How in the world did Samuel turn out so good in such a terrible environment? It's because of what Hannah put into him. Her spirit and her character was transmitted into her son, even her ability to touch God in prayer, which is probably the most outstanding feature of Samuel's life. He was a man of deep intercession and powerful, potent prayer. Where'd you get that, Samuel? He got it from Mama. He was a man of great character his entire life. All right, what, what lessons can we learn real, real quickly from this wonderful mother Hannah? Number one, when you're troubled, you need to go to God, not to the refrigerator, <laughs> not to the cigarettes, or to the bottle of wine, or to a bottle of tranquilizers, or into the arms of a stranger, but to God. As you know, a lot of people, that's their release valve. They're, they're under pressure. I've got to have a smoke. They're under pressure. I'm going to have a few drinks. I'm under pressure. I'm going to go sleep with son. I'm under pressure. I'm going to open the refrigerator and I'm going to devour its contents. <laughs> Hannah's under pressure. She's in trouble. And she goes to God. And I tell you, if you're barren in any area of your life, spiritually, financially, health-wise, or in relationships, 
If you'll go to God like Hannah, you can find an answer. We still serve a God who answers prayer. All right, secondly, that you don't have to retaliate when someone persecutes or mistreats you. Hannah went to God and God turned the table. She didn't lash out, though she was certainly sorrowful and inwardly grieved. She never responded in kind to Peninnah. She never allowed a root of bitterness to grow in her heart, never allowed resentment to come into her heart. She never mentioned that, never prayed against Peninnah. And you know, I don't know of a greater hindrance to answered prayer than bitterness of heart. If Hannah had allowed her heart to get bitter, she never could have prayed such a prayer of faith with that same heart for a male child. The number one thing that Jesus cites in his teaching for a failure to get an answer to prayer is unforgiveness or bitterness. And if I'm having trouble getting answers to my prayers, that'll be the first place I check my own heart, make sure no bitterness or unforgiveness has crept in there toward anyone. All right, third lesson. It's just, again, what a powerful influence a mother can have. Mom, listen, your son or your daughter doesn't have to join a gang. They don't have to take drugs. They don't have to be under peer pressure to lose their virginity. What you put into them at home, especially in the younger years, can counteract all that the world tries to lure them into. God can keep them, and maybe your kids are in a situation where they need rescuing. God can rescue them if that's, if that's the need. Think about, think about Hannah. Hannah knows what old pugilist and serpent mouth are up to. The whole nation, you know, is, despises the fact that uh, bringing their offerings to God because of what these boys are doing. And, and Everybody told Eli about what's going on, and he just wouldn't listen to it. He put his boys above God, and it actually ended up costing Eli. God said, you love your sons more than you love me, Eli. And think of Hannah. She's made this promise to God, and she's got this little boy that she loves, and she's going to give him to Eli, who's got these other two sons. She knows what's going on. The woman knew how to trust God. In fact, mother and father, listen, you will not always be able to have your eyes on your children. You better learn to trust them into the hands of God. He is well able to keep them and to deliver them if they need deliverance. All right, let's look at another intriguing story and another mother, 2 Samuel chapter 21. This is one of the most interesting stories in the Bible. It's about a mother named Rizpah. And she teaches us commitment. We'll open in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 21. It says, Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years. Year after year, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It's because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. Now Israel had made a covenant with the Gibeonites under Joshua, that they would be servants to them and that they wouldn't destroy them. But Saul tried to annihilate them. And not just Saul, his family. His bloodthirsty house is what the Lord said when David said, why is there this famine? God said, this is the root of it. This is why. And so David goes to the Gibeonites. He says, look, God's been talking to me. This is because of what Saul and his house did. What do you want me to do so that the, the, the drought will stop and the famine will stop? And the Gibeonite says, give us seven of Saul's offspring. And so David gives up seven of Saul's sons, and they execute them and hang their bodies up. And two of these boys were the sons of Rizpah, a concubine of King Saul. And we pick it up in verse 9. He delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest and in the first days in the beginning of barley harvest. Now Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of the harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. David was told what Rizpah, the daughter 
of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines had struck down Saul in Gilboa. So he brought up the bones of Saul, the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there. And they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin and Zelah, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all the king commanded, and after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. Now, it says that Rizpah, she went and she laid out this sackcloth on a rock by the bodies of her sons that were hanging up from the early barley harvest, the beginning of the barley harvest, which would have been April or May, and she diligently watched over them, kept the vultures from landing on them during the day, drove off the wild beasts that would have been brought in from the scent of those corpses at night. That would have been all the way till it said, until the late rains fell on them. That would have been October. Rizpah guarded the bodies of her boys for nearly six months day and night sleeping out on that rock until the rain came and no more claim could be made on them. She loved her sons and refused to be moved until they could receive a proper burial. See her out there in the blistering sun and searing heat. The bodies are decaying, they're turning black, and she stays. Not just days, not weeks, months. She is fiercely committed to her boys. And you know, mamas fiercely love their kids and are committed to them. And she can really teach us a lesson about commitment. She stayed determined. No doubt she was criticized, misunderstood, mocked by some, fatigued, but she stayed committed to what she believed was right. Her boys deserved a rightful burial. And she just stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed. And knowledge, you know, finally reached the ears of the king of what was happening. And you know, if you're going to finish your race for Christ, if you're going to accomplish whatever it is God's asking you to do, you're going to have to stay committed through confusion, through boredom, through attacks from the enemy, through betrayal, through temptation, through loneliness. You've got to stay steady during times of disappointment and fatigue, blessing and abasement. Whether you're understood or misunderstood, stay at what you know is right. It will eventually pay off. You know, it was through commitment that the snail reached the ark. <laughs> you need to have courage to fulfill what God's asked you to do in life. Certainly, but courage alone won't do it. You need character. Because courage without character will bring shipwreck. But courage and character by themselves are not enough. You also need commitment because God very rarely works according to our timetable. How many have ever noticed that? You see, God is almost always working on a greater picture than we realize. We see our own little part, but God's generally weaving that into this huge tapestry called, you know, destiny. And we don't see it all. I mean, us being in this building here, from the time we first engaged with property on Catella Avenue till the time we moved in, over nine years. A lot, of that, a lot of that time was spent in court. We had to navigate 10 different lawsuits. We have the distinction of being sued by two cities at the same time. And it was tough. But you know, God was working something far bigger at the time, and we just stayed steady. You know, as a church, thank God for all the people that just stood and prayed and hung in there. Because one of the major things that happened is when we actually ended up winning in federal court, a legal precedent was set that has helped hundreds of churches across the nation. Now, I'm even told that in some law schools, when it comes to law and, and land use issues, our case is one of the study cases that they do in law school now. But you know, here we're thinking, oh God, you know, we're out of space. We're turning people away every weekend. We got seven services every weekend. And God, I don't want to die. 
And so we're, we're seeing this need that we have, which maybe to us is fairly large, but God said, hey, there's this whole bigger tapestry, a whole bigger work that's going on. We didn't know about that. We didn't know about the legal precedent and how it, I mean, literally helped hundreds of churches. You wouldn't believe all the different reports we got from churches across the country that, that our victory aided them. And God was working something that was much bigger than us, but we didn't realize that. And you've got to stay committed because th generally there are much bigger things afoot than what we see or what we realize, you know, in our hour of crisis. God's always working something beautiful and something wholesome and something right. So whole course and keep your fire. Rizpa teaches us that, and actually her name means a live coal, like a burning coal from a fire. And she kept her fire that whole time, didn't she? She just would not relent. And it's one of the keys. You know, to keep that inner fire burning, don't let it die out when you experience seeming setbacks or delays. I want to look at one final place. This is in the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we want to look at verse 5. We're going to read about Timothy, who was to be Paul's most helpful and faithful companion, both in trial and in triumph. And in verse 5, Paul writing to Timothy says this, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Started with grandma. She had a genuine faith in God. Passed it on to her daughter. Her daughter passed it on to Timothy, and Timothy actually means one who fears God. Look with me, if you would, in verse, or chapter 3, verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. These godly ladies taught Timothy from childhood. What he was and the things he accomplished, you could attribute to his mother and to his grandmother. Listen, don't ever underestimate the influence that a grandma can have and that a mother can have. We read in Acts chapter 16 about Timothy's dad. He was not a believer. So perhaps his mother is in less than an ideal situation, but between mama and grandma, the tables were turned. And I just want to tell you, ladies, take the opportunities you have to teach your kids and your grandkids, or your great-grandkids, if that's what the case is. Man, read them those Bible stories when they're small. You don't know the impact that you may have upon their lives. Don't underestimate teaching them little lessons about faith in God and telling them your own story. If your faith is genuine, it will affect your kids. They're liable to end up with a genuine faith just like Timothy had. Genuine faith in Lois. Genuine faith in Eunice. Genuine faith in Timothy. Now the opposite of genuine is when it's just a pretense. When it's something we do at church, but we don't live at home. You know, the kids see that. Mom and Daddy got their hands lifted up, but they're terrorists in the home. <laughs> there shouldn't be any difference outside of the home and inside of the home, at church and in the house. And, you know, we'd, we've done a lot of things wrong, my wife and I raising our kids. I, I don't know why it works this way, but it would, wouldn't it be great to have the experience of a grandparent when you start as a parent? Huh. I mean, we'd do a lot of things different if we went back now, but we didn't know. We just did the best we could. But one thing we did right is we've always endeavored to live before our kids a genuine faith, and you can talk to any of them. Now, they, they could give you a long litany of my mistakes and the things that I've done wrong and maybe things that I should have done better. And I think one thing was we probably would have been a little less strict than we were in some areas. But you know what? They knew what mom and dad had was genuine. 
And Timothy, even though his father was an unbeliever, he saw something genuine in his mother's faith. And his mother and his grandmother taught him the scriptures from childhood. And Timothy went on to be Paul's most trusted, helpful companion, became a, a, a faithful and influential pastor, literally rocked the known world. But you could say, actually, Lois and Eunice rocked the world through their son. Samuel, what a, a force for God in his day. But you could say, actually, Hannah influenced the nation and rocked the world. She did it through her son. Those early years, she taught him to pray. She, she put character. She put virtue into him. And when she turned him loose, those things grew inside of him. Mothers, listen. We love you. We need you. We believe in you. And we thank you for the things that you sow into our lives. We wouldn't be who we are without you. And we need uh, our biological moms. It's true. We need our biological moms to teach us and instruct us and live before us. And we need some spiritual moms too. Some mothers in Israel who rise up and assume their role and fulfill their gifting in God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a minute? Lord, I pray for every person that's here today, man, woman, boy, or girl, that as they sit here, maybe they don't know what it is to have a genuine faith, a genuine relationship with you. Father, I humbly ask you right now to do what only you can do by your Holy Spirit, to convict, convince, convict, bring demonstration to hearts all across this great auditorium. Please, nobody looking around right now. I want to ask you a simple invitation. I'll give a simple, simple invitation to you. I invite you to pray with me. You may be here today and you don't know what it is to have a genuine faith in God. I, by that, I mean a faith that brings you into a relationship with Him. The Bible says that Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross to take away our sins and that through His sacrifice, we can come into a relationship with God. It's, it's not about ceremony or ritual or, you know, uh, just doing certain things by the numbers that, that somehow makes us right with God. But it really is about relationship. And God wants you to have a relationship with Him. You may be here today and you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ. You've never put your trust in Him. The Bible says if God, you believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead, and if you confess Him with your mouth as Lord, God brings you into a relationship with Himself called salvation. Literally, He makes you part of, your, uh, of His family. And you know, if you're here today and you're just sort of weighing things out on the balance and sifting things out, let me talk to you for just a minute. Because I'm convinced that there'll be people here today that in the deepest part of your heart, you know it's true. You already know it. And I realize, and I think most people realize, that there, there's a journey, you know, in coming to Christ where we ask questions and we sift through things and we put things in the balance and weigh them out because we realize that it's the biggest decision a person can ever make. But I think they're here today, people truly, that in your hearts you already know it's true. You know it is. And I'm going to ask you to respond today as we pray this prayer. And I believe it's important for you not to put off something that in your heart of hearts you know is true because an interesting thing happens when we put off a decision once we already know it's the right thing to do. Our heart actually begins to become calloused and hard. And it becomes easier and easier to continually put off that decision. And today, if you're here and you know in your heart of hearts that Jesus is the Son of God, that God wants to have a relationship with you, today's the day to make that decision. I want to invite you to pray with me, just a simple prayer. You say, oh God, I come before you today. I humble my heart, and I want to say thank you. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus who died on the cross for my sins. 
who was raised from the dead on the third day to give me peace with you. Jesus, thank you for bearing my sin. Thank you for dying in my place. I commit my life to you today. And I ask you to be my Lord. From this moment forward, Jesus, my life is completely yours. In your name I pray. Amen. Fantastic. I hope that you just prayed that prayer that uh, I prayed at the end of the message, a prayer to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's the starting point. It's not the finishing gate. You know, it's not the tape that you break at the end of the race. It's the beginning of an amazing journey. I've been walking with Jesus 35, 36 years, almost 37 years now. And I'll tell you what, he's more real to me today than he's ever been, and I love him. But more importantly, he loves me. And you need to know that he loves you as well. And what he doesn't want to happen to you is for you to become all religious and weird and spooky. I think when you accept Jesus in your life, you just become sort of supernaturally natural. You get to discover that person that God created you to be. And no, it is not always easy, but God is with you in the good times and he's with you in the rough patches as well. Now listen, if, if you've never written us or never sent us an email, we would love to hear from you. It would encourage my heart. We have a whole team here that would be encouraged by your correspondence as well. And you know, this broadcast goes out all around the world. Well over a hundred nations receive this broadcast. It's dubbed into a number of different languages, subtitled into certain languages. And we're just endeavoring to bring a living Jesus to a dying world. And I just want to ask you, encourage you, and challenge you, implore you to be a part of what is happening. There's great fruit coming from this all around the planet. And up to this point, our own church, Cottonwood Church in Southern California, has carried the lion's share. We love the world. And uh, we've carried the lion's share for, you know, what's, what's happened in Europe with the broadcast and what's happened, you know, nations around the planet. And our people gladly sacrifice to do it. But the truth is there's areas of our own buildings we haven't finished yet because we continue to sow into your life and into the lives of people like you. And it would just help us immensely if you could regularly support what we are doing. So why don't you pray about it and just tuck something in every month. You know, if a lot of people do something, even if it's small, it helps in a great way. And it all goes immediately back into taking the gospel to the nations. God will bless you as you respond. And we'll see you next time. Until then, bless you.